very much for coming to the picnic on the fringe with well with biscuits. A, a biscuit picnic is one of the best kinds of picnics, really. I think so. I think so. And um, we, we've got the three different types here, from the Jaffa cake to the custard cream to the shortbread. Also have hobnobs, but there's not space. There's not space for a hobnob. I know. You could well. I'll eat a few mm-hmm. and create space. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll do it brilliant. that way. Or I was considering making a bed of hobnobs for the biscuits that might... A hobnob foundation. Exactly. That's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Shortbread is brickwork. A Jaffa cake tiled roof. <laughs> Excellent. It's a very biscuit-based fringe for me. Mm. Sort of biscuits do feature kind of with everybody I meet. Which right. is it's kind of a bit strange in a way. Well, everybody has a favourite biscuit, don't they? Yes. Yeah. And your favourite biscuit is... I'm a big fan of a custard cream, actually. Really? That's uh, that's sort of my dad's influence. My dad very much was a custard cream eater. Mm -hmm. Uh, He gave up smoking shortly before I was born and replaced that with custard creams. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, he used to (laughs) munch his way through a packet a day in some instances. It's probably better on balance if you're eating custard creams than uh, smoking. But yeah, or would you rather die of lung cancer or diabetes? It's well, right. it's it's that toss up. <laughs> <laughs> so your show is your debut show. Yes. Here at the Pleasants, mm-hmm. um, Powell to the people. Yes. So a nice <laughs> little pun. Um, I was actually coming up. I was trying to think of names, and I thought it's quite nice to have a little a pun type name for the show. And I went through a couple. Uh, the Russ Hour. Like Rush Hour, uh, Russellmania, which was I quite liked. But one of the um, uh, promoter I met actually in Whitney, I was asking him about it, and he said, Why not Power to the People? Because it's quite good. So it stuck, and I went with it. It's very good. And you do also have to keep stuff in your back pocket, you know, for when you come back and back, and you've got to come yeah. up with more puns. Well, the thing is, if I do Russellmania, like Wrestlemania, I can just put a Roman numeral on the end of it each time. And that is true as well. Yeah, yeah that's for your trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> And how's it all going? Because it's kind of bedded in by now, I guess. Yeah, it? well, I've, I've kind of been doing the show... I did a very, very early version of it at the Brighton Fringe last year and um, like barely managed to struggle my way through an hour of doing material. <laughs> and and then since then, kind of built material, built built more stuff into it, and it's kind of developed... From when I first did it, it was basically just blocks of... 10 minute bits of stand up that I'd kind of written but now there's more of a, a theme and a, a story arc to it going through mm. which um, it's kind of it's basically just Power to the People is about it's all about me as most stand up shows are but it's sort of my beginnings in my hometown of Brighton and then going through school going through uni going into the real world and then how I've sort of then come to be a stand-up comedian. So it's almost your life story? Yes, it's very very autobiographical. Really. Uh, is it, now you've done your life story, do you, do you know where you can go from that, you know, next time? I've been kind of thinking about it. I want to, because what this, this show now, it does have an arc, but it is kind of a highlights reel of what I've written in stand-up so far. But I kind of, now I'm concentrating on it full-time and doing stand-up properly, I, I kind of want to build more I guess more thought provoking and more targeted type shows like I've actually been thinking about one um, I was discussing with um, someone the other day about the next show is going to probably be about um, sort of belonging and what someone is because you ask someone who they are and they'll give you a name and tell you a little bit about themselves but if you ask someone what they are that's a whole different kettle of fish like that opens it up to so many different things and it's kind of going to be about um, how people define themselves like through their job through their family through their friends through their experiences and just try and build it out that way it's a bit deep <laughs> it does but, sound it but, but it's hopefully good. funny yeah and it's good to be thinking that far ahead as mm. well you know because I suppose it can uh, you can do your first show and get very excited by it and then you think well now what yeah I guess there's that danger yeah how have you found it being your first show? People talk about the hour being a, a, a difficult time length or a different time length. Mm. Uh, how have you found working within that time frame rather than a club set? See, I quite enjoy having the longer time to work with because when, like, when you first start doing stand up, you always you do the competitions and you only get two, three, maximum five minutes to do a competition. I never really did that well because I felt constrained by by the time and where it's nicer to have 
the time to let ideas breathe and develop them and sort of just chat to people and build more of a rapport as well when you're on stage so like, I love doing 20 minute club sets it's awesome to do that because you can just go in just bang out bang out jokes and do it really well but I feel doing an hour set is much more what I want to do mm. rather than what I need to do kind of thing. I see I see it comes more from the heart yes it's more honest yeah, yeah, yeah definitely did you kind of make your name though through doing the competition sets is that how you built up I or? kind of I suppose I did I did a few competitions I got to the final of a few but never really won anything but I think I, I wouldn't even think that I had a name that I've built up so far but I'm just I'm just grafting and just trying to do as much as I possibly can but at the same time just enjoying it I'm doing what I love to do now whereas because I was working a day job like the earlier this year and I've now left that and doing comedy full time so it's given me the freedom to do what I want to do and it's just getting out there gigging as much as possible meeting as many people and trying to be funny <laughs> <laughs> how frightening was it to um, drop your job and say right this is me now it was kind of forced upon me in a way I was made redundant um, but it kind of came at the right time it was like a couple of months before now like a couple of months ago so it was the perfect time really for it to happen because it allowed me to free up my time to concentrate on doing the show properly and doing other gigs and actually not having to worry about who I'm letting down back at the office or whatever if I'm working remotely mm. um, but yeah so it's been a, it's been a, some would see it as sort of a bad thing to be made redundant but I've kind of embraced it and seen it as it's my opportunity to actually push forward and do do what I want to do properly just before Edinburgh like the first yeah it's literally a couple of months ago yeah yeah so I mean, I could imagine it would be hard to do a job and be at Edinburgh as well. And yeah, have that kind well, of I did it a life. couple of years ago. I, I did a, um, I didn't come up to Edinburgh last year, but I did a compilation show with two other guys not last year, year before, and worked remotely um, whilst up here as well, sort of on my laptop in the flat during the day, um, which I didn't really get as much out of Edinburgh as I should have because I was obviously distracted with actually doing work. Mm. But now I get to do things like this in the middle of the day. I don't have to worry. I get free biscuits. And <laughs> how how is it different? Because you you the compilation show working with other people. Mm. Do you relish in it just being you and you having total control over it? I don't, that sound it would sound a bit arrogant if I said yeah, it's all about me. I don't like working with other people. But I think for an Edinburgh show, it's just me is awesome. I love to do that. But at the same time, I really enjoy. Uh, MC and a lot of the work I do throughout the year is predominantly MC work so I like to be there working with the other acts and vibing off them and the audience and building a building an atmosphere kind mm. of thing, mm. so. Are there certain sort of people that are like natural at that MC thing? I think, I've, I've always said it, it's kind of a bit like um, it's, uh, comedy's a little bit like a martial art in that there's different aspects of it that people can master and someone can be really proficient at one element of comedy and whereas not so much like some people are tremendous like one liner writers and can really bang out bang through loads and loads of really good one liners but if you ask them to compare a gig they may not have the necessary sort of ability to engage with people on a one to one basis and pick up on things they've said and that kind of thing it seems very spontaneous and uh, yeah, I could imagine if you've got your if you if you've got your own pieces and you're very set to them, mm. it could be just petrifying. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. The first time you you did it, I guess is is that a big step to kind of just start talking to someone and not know where it's going to go? And yeah, do you just have to do it though in order to get good at it? Yeah, yeah. It's very much you just have to practice makes perfect. I, no one is a good MC straight away. I don't think. Because what, what I tend to do, I actually started doing it because I set up a gig um, where I live in Reading and emceed it myself. And I think when you first MC, you don't really understand. You kind of prepare new material each time and you try and just get material out. But as an MC, you don't necessarily have to do that. It's better to chat with the audience, make sure they're all right and see what they're about and maybe make some jokes, not at their expense, but with them, kind of thing, to bring them into it. And that's the mistake I made. I would come to MC gigs with pre-prepared material in my head and then just try and blast it out and it most of the time didn't work but now when I MC I don't take any 
ideas in my head with me. Like, that sounds stupid, mm. but, mm. No, but like, I don't go with anything pre-prepared. You don't know how it's going to go. No, which yeah. I quite you know, quite enjoy. I quite like the uh, the unknown aspect of it. Yeah. Stepping out yeah. and yeah, yeah. And I think when you see a really good MC, mm. it's like wow, because you do inevitably you do see some bad stuff yeah. out there. <laughs> but when yeah. someone's just totally got it, it's mm. like amazing, and you kind of trust them, and you. It's kind of an amazing thing, almost. Yeah, I think as well because sort of where where I've come up through the gigs, sort of from doing pub gigs to doing bigger gigs, you find a lot of promoters at the low level don't understand how important a good MC is to a gig. Mm -hmm. But they would rather spend a load of money on a headliner. But if you've got a crap MC people might not stick around <laughs> yeah. until the headliner gets on stage <laughs> so it's always better I think to sort of split any money that is going to be spent between a headliner and a good MC because the good MC will probably do more for the gig and help the audience more than a, than a headliner will mm. Mm. Russ it's been a pleasure thank you so much thank could you, you just uh, when is your show and where is it it's 10.45 every night in the Pleasance Courtyard in the attic excellent Cool. Thank you very much. Handshake shop. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And help yourself. To I a will. I'm having a custard cream or two. Mm.